Hello everyone, this is Paul the Okanite coming back to you once again with the second part of the Battle of Shiloh by Worthington Publishing. Where we left off was the end of the fourth turn of action and we're picking up at the beginning of turn five. The Federals had fallen back into a pretty sensible line and the Confederates are getting ready to push forward once again and see how many holes they can poke into it. So let's go ahead and pick up the action and see what happens. And the Union unit did not rally, so the Union player turn is done. Turn 5, this would be uh, 0900, and the uh, Confederates have everybody in command. The next thing they need to do is to uh, go ahead and move, because there's no offensive artillery fire for them. Confederate move. So the Southerners have moved up good and proper. They're putting pressure up and down the line. But the Union line is getting denser. The guys are coming up. They're joining the fight. Reserve divisions are moving in. And we have a pretty solid line on both sides, up and down. Uh, note that I had forgotten to, to resolve three looting rolls from the Confederates' prior move, so I took care of that. They took three additional hits. So right now we have 1,400 rebel casualties and 2,900 Federals. So right about a two to one ratio. So we'll, we'll continue the shooting and see what happens. So the Union banged away up and down the line. They actually were out of the end guy both, uh, on both ends of the Confederate line. This is one, the other is at the other end. And they delivered 10 hits. So up and down the line, you can see a smattering of hits with that guy up, uh, way at the end here. He routed as well. All right, so I'm gonna mark the hits and we're gonna shoot the Confederates. As a result of Confederate fire, 10 more casualties have been inflicted on the Union. But the main thing this turn was that there were, there were a lot of routes. A lot of guys routing, all kind of all over the place, which means the line is going to be squishier. And it also means that the Confederates had a lot of opportunities to advance. When you push a guy out of a hex because he routes, when you are offensive, you get to go ahead and take the hex. It's optional, not like the camp, but it is something that you want to take advantage of. For example, one reason is that it gives you an opportunity to put zones of control all around a unit. It makes it harder for him to get out. Basically, he's got a route out of there to leave. Otherwise, he's just going to stand there and get pounded. At this time, it looks like the Confederates have taken the bloody pond, so the hornet's nest is not going to prove to be that big of an obstacle this time around. It's Confederate rallies. There's only one rally at this point, so we will take care of that right now. Bada ba bada bing. Nope, he don't rally. Oh, and there's a guy on the other side. He's got the help of a leader. This guy up here. And he rallies. So we are up to the Union half of the 0900 turn, turn five. So for the Union half of the turn, they I've marked one guy out of command. The rest are okay. Everybody is now awake, so we no longer have to deal with that, although the camp stay on the map until the Confederate stumbles into them. In fact, I see one that I have to roll for, so I'll take care of that in a second. Then Union Offensive Artillery, and there's a couple shots I can do, although one I may not take as we want to get the artillery out of there. That would be that guy. I think it's time to leave. He had his fun. Down over here, we start seeing where things are getting more worrisome. We've got McDowell from Sherman. He's one point away from being shattered, which means he'll lower his morale to green and he can't go into a zone of control anymore. We've got guns kind of by themselves. There's seven left, I think. Yes, seven left. And, but here's the real problem. We have Peabody surrounded. Not, well, not surrounded. He's surrounded by zones of control, which means he can't move out of there. He can route out of there. It'll cost him an extra hit to do it, but he could, or just retreat out of there as a result of combat. But barring that, he can't move. So we're kind of stuck. We don't want to let him get surrounded because then he could pick up and pull. It's over 2,000 guys in there, there, so that would be a really bad thing. So it's almost like the Union is being forced to do some defending, forced to, uh, to try to relieve... Peabody, at least for one turn, to see if we can get him out of there. Same thing with this artillery battalion, but there's only two left. There's only two left here, so it's like, well, I don't really care. <laughs> uh, a bunch of guys routed. We have six routed units. 
we do have Hurlbut who can kind of be fed in, so that can help, but the real problem is right around Prentice. We're going to have to see what we can do. All right, I got some offensive artillery that I think I'm going to do. So the Union took two artillery fires as offensive fire. This one here almost worked. The morale row was a route, but he didn't hit. He was one pip away from actually delivering the hit that would have routed that guy and got Peabody out of there. So, eh, horseshoes and hand grenades, it didn't work. Okay, this guy fired, he missed miserably. That means they cannot move. So they're, they're anchored in place. Everybody else has got to reinforce around them such as we can. All right, we are now up to Union movement. Everybody's active. Grant is on the board. Here we go. So the Federals have done their 0900 move. The last division, WHL Wallace, has activated, and he's going into this mass of humanity that's milling around in Cloud Field. Thousands of Federal troops just trying to find somewhere to go, pulling away from the lines, a bunch of scared farm boys leaving the battle. We have uh, a desperate attempt going on here to relieve Peabody. Prentice in person and his unbrigaded unit is going in there. The unbrigaded guys are green, but with Prentice there, maybe they'll hold. The danger is if this gets fully surrounded, Peabody could be picked up off the map should he break morale. Right now he's got, was it, 2,200 troops? Oop, 2,400 troops. So that would be yet another disaster for the Union, should that occur. As we get to the right flank, things are looking a bit better. We do have at least something in here, as well as something screening over there. So they're, the right side is not so bad. It's really the center. The center right now is very squishy. That's where we're pushing the reserve division. It'll take another turn for them to get there. And uh, hopefully we get some rallies and can start pushing some of those guys back to the front. Three of Sherman's four brigades are routing right now. Not a good thing. All right, so the Union has done their offensive artillery. They've done their movement. It's now time for the Confederates to shoot. And in the center, there were some hits delivered. Nobody broke, including Peabody, who also took a hit. Uh, so I'm going to mark the hits, and we're going to return fire. And the Union return fire delivers five hits, as well as forcing Trebu, an elite unit, to retreat. And that allowed uh, Williams to go ahead and move back up adjacent to the Peach Orchard. So they're, they're pushing back to, to uh, put some pressure on the Peach Orchard. Two hits were delivered on one of the units that's kind of putting pressure on Peabody, but uh, he didn't move. He just took hits, and he's still there. So now we have to mark the hits, and I'm going to roll for all these routes, these many, many routes that the Union needs to recover from. So we are now at 1,000 hours on the morning of April 6th, first day of the battle. The score is, let's see, we have 4,300 4, Federal casualties and 3,100 Confederate casualties. I've been seeing uh, the Confederates starting to catch up in casualties because of the looting. You know, so guys that are going back with their booty back to whatever camp they started from are just as out of combat as Union troops running back to Pittsburgh Landing to try to get over the river and leave. Neither one is doing any work for their side. So I think that's what we're seeing. Still have a critical situation here by the Peach Archer. The Yankees made a little bit of progress by pushing back Trabru. This guy, this elite unit who decided just he didn't route, but he did fall back, uh, relieving some of the pressure, but still Peabody remains locked in zones of control. The Union troops are forced to go up to the front of the line to try to give some relief. I don't know how much longer they're gonna be able to do that. Going down the line, it's a bit better, but it doesn't get you know, good until we get out here to the tail. So the situation remains critical. We have another Union division coming up. WHL Wallace is coming up. And we did have four of the six Union routers rally, but they're not in the line yet. It's going to take another, another Union move to get them there. So right now, it's kind of a come-as-you-are party for what the Union line can offer. All right, there's no activity until the Confederate movement phase. So I'm going to go ahead and execute that movement. 
So the Confederates all bucked up, up and down the line, as you can see, and I went ahead and did the uh, Union defensive fires, and they were eventful. Uh, in particular, Peabody has extricated himself. What happened is that Johnson, the guy right here, he got fired on by three guys. Okay, three consecutive hexes gives a plus one. Minus two for the woods, so a net minus one. He was on a maximum table, 33 plus, and rolled a 10. That delivered four hits and pushed him back two. And it's not a morale check. That's just he has to retreat to. Had to go through a Zoc to do it. Uh, one point of artillery closed the ring, and so he took a fifth hit. So that pretty much demolishes that brigade. He's one hit away from being shattered, so he's not going to be of much use much longer. And Peabody gets off the hook. How about that? There he is. He's just fine. It's going to be the Union gets the next move. Uh, Confederates are going to do what they do when they shoot, but in no way can they surround him or and cause him... Uh, massive losses. Confederates did some routing this turn too, as you see up here. They took two routes over here, they took a retreat over there, a couple of retreats over there, but not routes. So it was a very good turn for the Union. In addition, the Union did three, or excuse me, five, eight, 12 hits, 1,200 Confederates are down. All right, let me mark that, and then we're gonna do the Confederate States fire, their offensive fire against the Union troops. So the Confederates take their shots. They routed the cavalry unit that had been holding the end. So now they've got kind of a dangerous run that they can do towards Pittsburgh Landing. The Federals have to do something about it. Fortunately, they do have a reserve brigade here that I think is going to be able to head this off. But it is time to pull back, at least a little bit. Although the Federals are putting up a tough fight in the hornet's nest. The peach orchard is kind of going back and forth. That right now, the Federals have the advantage. If they wanted to, they could have this whole woods line, but I didn't want to put a guy here in case, say that the Confederates hit him again, pushed him back, and now Peabody's surrounded again. So we got to get him out of there and this whole thing straightened out before I think about doing that. I see two, four, six, seven, eight, eleven, eleven more hits to Union units, so we're grinding each other up pretty well here. Plus, there was one looting roll here, the Confederates took one point on. So right now the score stands 5,400 dead uh, Union infantry or casualties, they're not dead, and 4,300 Confederates. So there's 1,100 difference between them. The gap is absolutely narrowed as we're going forward here and the Federals are fighting like the devil to hang on to the hornet's nest in the center area. All right, I'm gonna mark things. The next thing is there's a couple of Confederate rallies I'm going to take care of, and then we're into the Union turn. At the end of the turn, the Confederates had one of two units rally. One did, one didn't. And so we are up to the Union half of turn six, which is the 1000 hour turn. Everybody's in command at this point in time, even even Stewart's in command. Uh, Sherman finally got over by him and they're consolidating in the right center part of the line. The Union needs to also consolidate along here and reform this line because that is the most direct path to Pittsburgh Landing. Did a little bit of math and yes, the Union has to fall back no faster than one hex a turn. That's pretty much the, at a 50-50 mark right now, if the Confederates can get one hex a turn, uh, it's possible they could take it on their last turn. But yeah, we have some game to play between then and now, so we'll see what happens. All right, so the Union is in command. The, everybody's active, so we don't deal with that phase anymore. I'm going to waive all artillery fire, offensive artillery fire, in favor of moving everything. So it's the Union move. So I went ahead and did the Union move, and uh, then I went ahead and did the, the one exchange fire that there was. Let me explain. Uh, the Union moved up in this angular sort of formation, so their line is pretty orderly, except for the right flank, which is kind of torn a little bit, but there's enough there to stop the Confederates from just kind of going forward, especially with this cavalry back here. There's uh, Bedford Forrest and his buddies, and we have to keep them in check. I think it'll be okay, partly because we have 
most of WHL Wallace yet to commit to the line. Tuttle is the only Wallace unit in the line right now. So I think the plan is to slide Sherman and McClernand over to the right to fill in the right side of the line while we feed WHL Wallace into the line right at the pivot here. Meanwhile, we've got Hurlbut is responsible for protecting the direct route to Pittsburgh Landing. As long as he can do that, I think the Union is in fair shape. We extricated Peabody from the trap that he was in, and he's not too badly hurt. He's got 2,100 guys there, so he took six hits. Not too bad considering the position that he was in. He was facing a possible annihilation. But not only did we do that, but Johnson took a big hit. And he's, only, he's got only 1,100 guys left of his 2,000. One more hit, and he's combat ineffective. And in the meanwhile, we do have our first combat ineffective brigade. That would be McDowell, one of Sherman's brigades. So he can no longer advance into a zone of control. And he is now acting like a green unit, all 900 of him that's left. Overall, it looked pretty precarious for the Union there for a bit, but they seem to have recovered for the time being. Finally, I did the rallies for the Union, and I think they had like five guys, three of them rallied, two of them didn't. We had those green guys sometimes are hard to do. They're 50-50. So and if you put a leader there, okay, you get a 10% kicker, but the leaders are busy. They are jumping on guys trying to get them to rally all over the place. We are now at the 1100 turn, which would be turn seven in terms of the game. It is the Confederate player turn, and there are no command radius issues, so... We're going to dive straight into the Confederate move. And the Confederates, as expected, have bucked up against the Union line all the way up and down the line. It's going to be another massive exchange of fire. On the Union right flank, we have the Confederate cavalry getting into action with uh, Bedford Forrest in the lead. They've all dismounted, and they're starting to work over this Union cavalry unit that's defending. All right, the Yankees get to shoot. And the Southerners got off a little light this time with only 700 casualties. We did have a pretty lucky shot at this side. 100 guys here was able to rout a 2,000 mad infantry brigade for the Southerners. So that was kind of interesting. The other thing that was new that happened was that the Tyler and Lexington were able to open up on Statham. Uh, they can shoot out to range four during the Union turn. They ignore line of sight, but they don't ignore terrain, so the terrain modifiers still apply. And they don't hit for casualties. All they can do is make a unit route. So they tried, they didn't make it, and that was it. All right, 700 casualties. Let me mark them, and we'll do the Confederate shots. The Confederates have taken their shots, and of course it was bad for the Yankees. There were 11 hits. The guys on the left flank got kicked out and so allowed an advance. One more hex closer to Pittsburgh landing. Uh, we had Peabody is, is surrounded with Zox again, so he's stuck. The guy that was next to him uh, got hit and left. Another hit, he didn't leave, but on the end, the guy got hit and retreated. He didn't route, but he did retreat, which allowed an advance. And on the end, uh, he, t he took off too. He routed away. So a lot, of, a lot of damage that time in, in addition to the actual hits. All right, so I'm going to mark the hits, and uh, we'll go on to uh, rallies for the Confederates. Okay, the casualties are marked. Neither of the Confederates that were routed have rallied. They both blew their rolls, so that's about the only good news for the Union this player turn. We're done with the Confederate turn for 1100. We are on to the Union turn. Uh, everybody's in command control. The only artillery shots for the offensive artillery phase are going to be the Lexington and the Tyler, the two gunboats. We're going to take shots at this guy. We're going to take two separate shots, see if we can force a morale check here at least. All right, shot number one. And it is a hit, but uh, he saves morale. Second one. It's another hit, and he also saves morale. So, all right, so the gunboats got close, but uh, instead of made his morale checks, again, the only thing that these gunboats can do is force morale checks, is what they did, and, uh, well, it didn't help them. So we are done with offensive artillery. 
we're on to union movement to try to salvage something out of this. So the union in general has pulled back. We did maintain contact here, so we're really hoping that that cavalry does not run. That would be kind of bad if they did, although, well, it would take a whole bunch of movement points to go anywhere. But still, they've got to seal off this edge. It could be decisive. Uh, we've also got Peabody hung out to dry again. Maybe he can route out of there. He'll take some more hits. Too much more of this, and it isn't going to matter. He's not going to be any good anymore, no matter what happens. And we continue on down the line. We've got our Union line quilt over here, and we've sealed off to the river. Still not as stout as I would like to see, but uh, we, will, we will be able to hang on again this turn. So the Union has moved. There's going to be Confederate defensive fire down here at the end of the line, as well as by Peabody. So from the Confederate defense fire, three hits were delivered. One hit was on the cavalry unit on the flank, but he did not run at least. And Peabody took two hits. And the guy that was giving support didn't take any hits, but he just ran. So uh, that unit is getting hung out to dry pretty, pretty badly at this point. Although as he keeps shrinking, he starts becoming less and less important. All right, let me mark the hits and we're gonna shoot with the Yankees next. The Union achieved two hits. Nobody ran, so it really didn't change much of anything. The Union will now do their rallies, and when that's done, we will be done with turn eight and moving on to turn nine. And the Union did okay with the rallies, although we do have still to have two stubborn holdouts here. There's this Green Morale guy that is ignoring Grant for the last couple of turns who's been trying to rally him. And that's what we're dealing with. I think maybe we're going to be losing Peabody after all. So we'll have to see how that goes. We're done with turn eight. We're on to turn nine. Confederates have no command control problems. They have no offensive artillery shots. So we're into movement for the Confederates. And the Southerners have done their move. And once again, they're pushing for all they're worth up and down the line. If nothing else, Peabody is tying down a bunch of guys. So... Maybe, uh, maybe he can keep this going for a while before he, he goes away. We'll see. Uh, and uh, just up and down the line, we can see we've bucked up as much as we can. The cavalry has engaged over on this flank. They're dismounted, and they're hitting the infantry unit to their front. All right, we are up to the Union defensive fire phase. And this time it was a, uh, a kind of a mixed bag for the Yankees. They got eight hits on the Confederates. But they rolled hot and cold. They rolled very cold in a lot of places. But they rolled hot in two places. They got three hits on this guy and three more on that guy. And this guy is actually gone combat ineffective. And so is Johnson down here. So I think we had two uh, Confederate brigades go combat ineffective. That was going to start telling as the Confederate units have to drop out of the line of attack. However, I'm also seeing that the Union is struggling to get on the high tables. They're not getting up on that 33-plus table so much anymore. So their fire is starting to slacken down as they've taken casualties. All right, that is the Union defensive fire. Now we're going to have the Confederate offensive fire. Some of the Confederates fired their shots, and they did rather well once again. They did 10 hits, including a massive hit on this artillery unit over here. Four hits, three from rolling, and he had a limber up and leave that did another hit. Uh, let's see, we're curling around the flank again here. That's bad. Uh, most of the guys in the line did hold okay. We should be able to still have a, some kind of line next turn. Peabody left, so he got out of his trouble. He's routed away and uh, finally out of his predicament uh, for good at this point. That's the Confederate offensive fire. I have to mark the casualties and do the rallies. So the Confederates have done their rallies. Uh, they had three possibilities. Only one of them rallied. Two of them are still routing. Uh, also note that uh, there were two Confederate units that went into Union encampments this turn. And between them, they took three hits. So the 10 hits on the uh, Union Army was offset a little bit by the three hits on the Confederates for walking into encampments. And we have another combat ineffective Confederate. This cavalry unit here is no longer going to in, into uh, Yankee zones of control. 
So there's, they do have some units dropping out, but they still have a lot of units that are strong. So they're, my, they're by no means used up yet. All right, that concludes the Confederate player turn. We're on to the Union player turn. There is no, there are no command control problems. Uh, we do have offensive artillery fire that leased the gunboats, and I think, uh, I, well, that's it. Notice that uh, I have set up this whole line of Union artillery here. It's clear over where these guys are. And so when, when they pull back and the Confederates get there, all those artillery are going to open up while the Confederates in the clear. And artillery at range one shooting an infantry is double strength. So it should be reasonably powerful shots uh, without any uh, die roll modifiers to the negative. So that's, uh, that's kind of a line in the sand to keep them away from Pittsburgh Landing, which again is right there. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and start the Union turn with some artillery fire from the Tyler and Lexington. We're going to shoot this guy in the flank. Who's on the flank? It's not a flank shot, per se. Uh, we'll do two shots, two four-banger shots. So, first one, it's going to be minus two, ten, two. Well, he hit him, but he'd, the guy held his morale. The second one also hit, and he also... No, no, the second one missed. So... The gunboats are there for harassment factor. They're not there to do much, and they aren't doing much. All right, so the Union offensive artillery fire is done. We're up to Union movement. So the Union in general has pulled back and broken contact. Couple exceptions. Down here, we're, we've maintained contact and actually have two decent-sized brigades now instead of one shot-up cavalry unit facing this guy in the end. So hopefully that's going to be enough of a speed bump to start slowing that guy down. And uh, we're not going to let this understrength cavalry unit dissuade us from staying in these hexes. So we're going to exchange fire there. I'm going to go ahead and do all the exchanges of fire. It's not going to be a whole lot. Then we will be up to the rally phase for the Union. So the units exchanged fire. The Confederates did nothing with any of their shots. However, these two brigades that I brought up did put a twist on this guy. Three hits and pushed him back too. Did not rout him, but did deliver some hits to him. And a nibble on the cavalry unit up here for a total of four hits on the Confederates, none on the Union. That was the uh, offensive fire, or the exchange of fire, the defensive and offensive fire in the Union half of the turn. Of the rallies, there were, I think, four successes, two failures. And once again, these green guys simply refused to listen to Ulysses Grant, who's stacked with them, and I think they failed three consecutive rolls so far. So that's got to be making Grant a very unhappy guy. So here we are at the end of turn nine. I think uh, it's probably a good time to break. We've gotten in, I think, five turns, and we have five daylight turns remaining. So I think that would be a good place to begin part three, which would be the next turn, turn 10. Right now, the Union has a semi-stable line. They have firmed up the left flank. They're not in bad shape. They do have some low morale units there, some green units there holding the line, but that's par for the course in this battle. They are still squishy on the right flank, but the main threat on the right flank is this hex. This is where Lew Wallace comes in, so the Federals want to hang on to this through turn 14. Then they get a whole nother division coming on there, a fresh division, which is going to do good things for them uh, on the second day. All right. If you've stuck with me this long, I appreciate it. I'd love to have your subscription. If you uh, want to see more of this kind of good stuff, make it easy on yourself by subscribing, hitting the notification button. And I do enjoy your comments very much. It, they help me a lot. I, I've learned a lot from the comments that I've received from you guys. But for now, I think that's a wrap on part two of this series. So I think at this time, I'm simply going to wish you all a pleasant evening. Bye-bye.